I told first service it's been a great service so far, so we'll just pray and go home, right? <laughs> good music, good special music. Thank you for doing that this morning. Uh, just a good service. Today we do conclude our series of home improvement, and then next week we're going to start a new series called The Game of Life. And we're going to look at one of my favorite books, walk through one of my favorite books of the Bible, and that's the book of Philippians. And so we're going to start that next Sunday. But right now, let's go ahead and pray as we get started. God, we thank you for uh, just this opportunity to come to worship, um, to come to praise, um, to come and show our love for you. And uh, as we come in here, uh, may we listen to your voice, and may we listen to what you would have us to do, how you would have us to act, and we just want to follow your footsteps and your, our role model, and everything we need to know is in uh, the Bible. And so I pray that we turn to that and we follow it each and every day. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 2,600 years ago, it was the year 640 B.C., and there was a new king over all of Israel, and his name was Josiah. Now here's the thing about Josiah. Josiah was only eight years old when he became king of Israel. So he had a lot of growing to do in becoming the king, but God had him there for a reason. Now, here's another thing about Josiah. Josiah didn't have good spiritual role models in his life. If you look at his ancestry, Josiah's dad, Ammon, was an idolater. If you look at his grandfather, Manasseh, he was an idolater. And so there were all these false gods, and idolatry was running rampant through the, the country and through the countryside at this time. And all of Josiah's ancestors had bought into this methodology of worshiping false gods instead of worshiping the one true God. And there were many false gods. There was the god Molech. Molech was a fertility god, and women would bring their newborn babies and have them burned alive as an offering to Molech. And Josiah's dad and grandfather not only approved this, but actually encouraged it. There was the god Asherah. And these are references, if you've read the Old Testament, you'll read about Asherah poles in the Old Testament. Well, these were poles that were set up, and they were used as a form of worship. It was a very uh, seductive, very perverted form of worship. And they were all over the hills of Jerusalem, and they even had some in the temple at Mount Moriah. You see, the people had strayed so far from worshiping the one true God, and they were worshiping these false gods because they could, you know, that way have their self-pleasure and their indulgent pleasures rather than centering upon the one true God. And I think all of us here this morning can relate to Josiah at least a little bit because we live in a culture now that is, we see this becoming more and more popular to worship these false gods. Only I have to believe that back in Josiah's day, believe it or not, was actually worse than it is now. But Josiah set out to break this dysfunctional cycle of what he had experienced. 2 Kings chapter 22, verse 2 says this, He, speaking of Josiah, did what was right in the eyes of the Lord and followed completely the ways of his father, not turning aside to the right or to the left. Now we know that David was not his real father. But he was one of his forefathers. And David's reputation of being a godly leader was an inspiration to the godly Jews for decades and even centuries to come. And here's what I want you to see, though, from Josiah's example. Josiah chose to break the cycle. He chose to break the cycle of dysfunction. Maybe you didn't have the greatest dad. Maybe you feel like in your own parenting, man, I'm not doing very good at being a dad at all. And we can relate to that some. But we all hold within us the ability to change things. Your dad may have been abusive. He may have been arrogant. He may have been condescending in the way he talked to you. He may have not had a walk with the Lord. But, but here's the thing. You can change things. You can make a difference. You can start a healthy cycle. Or maybe you come from a family where you had godly spiritual leaders as parents. You know what? You need to continue that cycle. And that's a decision that I want you to make today. Will you break the cycle or will you continue the cycle if it's a healthy cycle? You see, the parallel of seeing God as Father makes a lot of sense to a lot of people if they have a good spiritual earthly father. 
But for a lot of people, they have a hard time seeing God as Father because their father wasn't a good spiritual role model or they didn't have a good relationship with their father. And so it's difficult for them to hear God the Father. It, it even becomes a stretch for them to even see God as a father because they didn't have a good role model here on earth. You know, sometimes as we're approaching Father's Day, I have, uh, I've had people in the past come up to me and say, you know, Wes, why is it that on Mother's Day you preach these soft and, you know, fluffy sermons for moms, and then comes Father's Day and you just beat us into the ground? Well, I don't mean to beat you into the ground. But men do respond to challenges better. And so this morning, here's my goal. My goal is for you as dads, as men, as fathers, to be challenged, but also to be encouraged. I want you to be encouraged. And I want us to walk away this morning with three different habits that we can do as fathers that we can then bestow upon our children. And here's the first habit that you need to develop. Affirming words. Affirming words. Bill Glass leads a national um, ministry to those who are in prison, inmates. And, and Bill has spoken to inmates all over the world. He's spoken to hundreds of inmates at a time. There was one time he spoke to about a thousand inmates at one time. And he tells about a time that he was speaking to these inmates, just this huge room filled with inmates. And he asked them this question. He said, how many of you had a father or parents who told you time and time again that one day you were going to end up in prison? And he said, nearly every inmate raised their hand. You see, there's power in words. Words are important. And that's why you need to decide that you are going to break the cycle. You can choose to tear down with your words, or you can choose to build up with your words. And your kids know which one that you are the most natural at. Proverbs 12, 18 says, The words of the reckless pierce like a sword, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. And so we are called to speak encouraging words, words that heal, words that strengthen, rather than negative words that wound and discourage. Christian author John Eldred says it like this, Your son or your daughter, no matter how old, will always want and need to hear these words from you. You have what it takes. You are worth fighting for. And that's what kids need to hear from us as parents positive comments, this attitude that, that will help shape our kids' future, their self-esteem into the future. So affirm your kids. Dads, that means you tell your daughters they are beautiful, that they are talented, that they are gifted. And dads, that means you tell your sons they have what it takes, that they can do what they set out to do. And catch your son doing something good. Catch him doing something positive. And then you know what you need to do? Compliment him in front of other people. Use affirming words. Let them know that you're there for them. The second habit that dads can pass on is that is active involvement. Active involvement. Now, I have to admit, this is an area that I struggled with early in my fatherhood, especially with my oldest daughter. Uh, mainly because I was being pulled in so many different directions. It wasn't that I didn't want to be involved with her. I just felt like I was pulled in so many different directions. And some of you can relate to that. You know, part of it was my job, but I'll tell you what a big part of it was. It was just my personality. It was my personality, and at times I gave my children the leftovers instead of giving them the quality time that they needed and deserved. And I think sometimes we underestimate the impact that active involvement can have on our kids. Little Becky was in a kindergarten class, and, and they were drawing pictures of their families. And they were going to take these pictures and then transfer them onto plates that they would take home and then cherish forever. And so little Becky was working diligently on her plate and, and the drawing that was going to go on her plate, and she drew a picture of her mom, of herself, and of her dog. And she even went into such detail as to draw the baby that was in her mommy's belly. And she was so proud of this picture that she had drawn that was going to be put on a plate to be taken home. The only problem was Becky's mom wasn't divorced. And Becky's mom wasn't a single mom. And she took that plate home with the picture of her, her mom, and her dog. And her dad said, that's the way she saw our family. I spent so much time at work that I wasn't even in the picture. 30 years later, Becky's dad still has that plate. And they have a great relationship because that plate was, he said, was the turning point in his parenting. 
And that was the time when he realized that he needed to be more actively involved in the lives of his children. And fathers, we too, we need to be intentional about being involved in the lives of our children. All fathers and mothers want to be in the picture. But the truth be known, we're just, sometimes we're just not really sure how to go about it. And then Satan comes in with these lies and he gets in our ears and he says, you know what, your kids don't need you involved. They'll just naturally find the Lord. It's okay. They don't even want your involvement. They just want you to stay out of their lives. And that is a lie from the pits of hell. Because you need to be involved in your children's lives. They desperately need you. They need your involvement. They need your encouragement. They need your support. Paul Harvey used to say, parents spell love, T-I-M-E. And I think that's true. And you may say, well, I want to do something, but I don't really know where to start. Well, I remember a few weeks ago or a couple weeks ago, I had up the three stations set up up here. The first station represented meal time. The second station represented being in the car, you know, travel time. And the third station represented bedtime. Those are the three starting points. That's where you start. You start at mealtime or in the car or at bedtime, beside your child's bed, talking to them, praying with them, getting involved in their lives. You need to pour into your kids. And you choose one of these times and you start pouring into them. You know, one of the strategies we came up with a couple of years ago for our church to accomplish our vision was this. As a church, we want to build spiritually healthy homes by equipping godly men to lead and to pray for their families. And that's why we started this year off with the year of relationships. And for the first six months, we have focused on relationships, marriage relationships, and and family relationships. And I want to remain committed to this goal. That's why two years ago, we started the Every Man a Warrior you know, group. And we had about 28 men start into that group. We had about 15 that finished the whole series, all three books. And we're going to start that back up this fall, and I'm going to offer different times for us to meet and and come together and go through that series again. And if you were not a part of that series the first time, you need to get in it. If you started into it the first time, but then you dropped out partway through, you need to get back in it and start from the beginning again. My group, who actually most of them finished the course, We're looking at going through it again just because we feel like we need to go through it again. It's great. You're going to hear more about it when we get closer to the fall. But you see, God is the ultimate parent. And he fleshes out for us all the different things that we are trying to do and to teach as parents. And God is, here's the thing about God. God is always available. God always has time for us. I love the passage in Matthew 11, 28 through 30, where Jesus says, Come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And if you need to talk, God's ready to listen. You need a shoulder, God will give you his. So dads, let me ask you this question. What would you say, what would your children say is the most important thing in your life? Whether they're 15 or whether they're 50, What would your kids say is the most important thing to you? Is it your job? Is it your golf clubs? Is it a bicycle? Your faith? Your house? Boat? Car? Hunting rifle? Your personal walk with Jesus Christ? What would your kids say? Here's a third area that I want you to see this morning, and that is spiritual leadership. Spiritual leadership, and this is the most important one, but at the same time, it's probably the most difficult one because here's what we think. We think, I do not measure up. I cannot be the spiritual leader in the home. I am not equipped to be the spiritual leader. And yet, that is exactly what God has called us to be as fathers, is to be the spiritual leader, to be that source of spiritual encouragement, to breathe the fresh wind of the Holy Spirit into the ears and into the hearts of our children. And so there are four ways that I think we can lead spiritually. Number one, is to teach respect. Teach respect. And while teaching respect, it comes back to what we talked about several weeks ago, the heart of discipline. You know, there are a lot of areas in which you need to teach your children respect. And one of those areas is you need to teach them to respect older people. You need to teach them to respect their peers. You need to teach them to respect you as a parent. You know, even when at times maybe they don't feel like it. You know, like I said before, to you kids in here, there is one command in the Bible that is written specifically to kids. And it's Ephesians chapter 6, verse 1, and it says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. 
And so if your parents are asking you to do something that is spiritual, that is godly, then you do what they ask you to do without complaining. It means you humble yourself, you swallow your pride, do what your parents ask you to do, all right? And maybe you got to get down on your knees and say, God, I'm going to need help to do this, but you do what they ask you to do. You know, parents, you got to teach them respect. Teach them that respect is the heartbeat of relationships, and it's mutual respect, respect for each other. The second way to teach them is to model grace. Model grace. And parents, I don't think I need to tell you, you will have ample opportunities to show grace to your children. If my parents were here today, they could tell you that I gave them countless opportunities to show me grace. Sometimes spiritual leadership is shown through grace rather than force. I like what Tyler Edwards writes. He says, a man who believes he has to raise his voice to a woman in order to make him feel like a man is not one. A man who believes he has to raise his hand to another person to make him feel like a man is not one. One of the primary differences between just being a male and being a man is your ego. Let's look at a third way. A third way that we can lead spiritually and to share, and that is to share our faith. And this can only happen if you have a personal walk with Jesus Christ, because you can't lead someone where you have not been. How many of you have heard of the Walinda family? Anyone? They just made the news again recently. Okay, five years ago, on June 15, 2012, Nick Walinda, tightrope, walked across Niagara Falls. Anyone watch that five years ago? Remember watching that? All right. Well, this past Thursday, on June 15th, his wife decided to celebrate the five-year anniversary of that by breaking one of his records, and that is hanging from a helicopter 300 feet up in the air by her teeth and by her toes. All right? And so she did that over Niagara Falls to celebrate his five-year anniversary. And she, she did it. She did it. But here's the thing. I, not focusing on her, but focusing on him. I remember watching him walk across Niagara Falls in that tightrope. Now, here's the cool thing about that if you didn't see it. He was wearing a microphone, and they were actually doing a live interview with him as he's walking across the falls, carrying this 40-pound pole in his hand, all right? So he's walking across, and when they weren't interviewing him, you know what he was doing? He was praying, and he was praising God. It was the coolest thing. He's praising God the whole way across the falls. This heavy mist had to be like a rain hitting him, and he's walking on this two-inch diameter steel cable, walking across the falls and, and praising God. And he got done so early that they had to continue the live interview with him after he had finished walking across. And every question they asked him with his wife and his kids present, he kept taking it back to God. Every question, he would take it back to his faith in God. He would talk about his faith with his family. He would talk about how his faith got him there. He, he even quoted Philippians 4.13, and he said, you know, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And I love the next day, someone put this out there. They said this, who was more nervous last night, Nick Walinda over Niagara Falls or ABC executives over his live commercial-free talk about Jesus? <laughs> it's true. But here's a dad who is a bold witness and unapologetic in his faith. And he provides an example for his kids. And dads, when your children hear you praying before a meal or when they hear you praying with them at bedtime at night, when they see your Bible laying on the coffee table or in your nightstand or in your office at work, that communicates something to them, whether they're old or whether they're young. Well, a final way to show spiritual leadership is to protect your family. Protect your family. And I know your dads are going, ha, 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 that's the one, I got that one down. To protect them spiritually. To protect them from outside forces. Now here's the thing, you can't do that on your own. You can only do that with the intervention of God. I came across something that James Dobson used to do with his kids when they were young. And he would take them to a window in the house and he would say this, look outside there. Out there the world can be a rough and cruel place. But here in this home, this is a safe place that we can all count on no matter what. And so as a family, you lean on one another, you support one another, you encourage one another. And if there's any single moms in here this morning, I, I just want to share with you one of my favorite verses found in Psalm 68, verse 5. And it refers to God as the father of the fatherless. The father of the fatherless. And what that says is, you know what, you can count on God. You know, sometimes he 
uses other men, other Christians to fill the gap that maybe your children have in their lives. And you know, when it comes to being a protector, there is no greater protector than God. God loves to protect. Love protects what it loves. Love protects what it loves. You've heard us talk in our church a lot about baptism over the years. You know, baptism is identification with Jesus Christ. And as you're baptized, you're, you're symbolizing the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. And you're dying to that old way of life, and you're coming up a new person. And it's just great. It's just a great picture. And, and you're publicly saying, you know what, I, I'm, on, I'm on Jesus' side. I'm on his team. And here's the thing. When Jesus was baptized, it wasn't because he was full of sin. It was because he was setting the example for us to follow. But I want to take that baptism of Jesus, and, and I want to close with that this morning. I want to look at that, and you'll see here in a minute why I want to do this. I want to look at the passage in Matthew chapter 3, right after Jesus is baptized. You're familiar with what takes place maybe in Matthew chapter 3. Jesus comes from Galilee. He comes to the Jordan River to be baptized by John the Baptist. And I want you to hear what it says, verse 16, starting in verse 16. It says this. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was opened. I would have loved to have seen this. Heaven is open. At that moment, heaven was opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, whom I love, and with him I am well pleased. Now I want you to look at that. Because every time I read this, this is a perfect picture of fatherhood. Do you see what the Father is doing with the Son right here? What he's passing on? This is the very same thing that we as dads, as Christian dads, must be passing on to our kids. Look what it says. The very first thing God says to Jesus, this is my son. In other words, I'm proud of him. I'm proud of him. You know, th this one's mine. This one's mine. Jesus belongs to me. I'm responsible. You touch him, you touch me. He's mine. And it's the same with us, the same with us as fathers. We have to communicate to our kids, this one is mine. And secondly, look what he says. He says, whom I love. I love this boy. I love him. Can you imagine God's voice breaking through the clouds after Jesus' baptism and is putting a stamp of approval on, on Jesus and he's saying, you know, this is my son. I love him. And you know what? He loves me back. You see, a lot of fathers love their children, but sometimes they don't get that love back. And you can tell when a child is disobedient or when they don't honor their father. And it needs to be a two-way street. And then here it is. God is saying, man, I love this boy, and this boy loves me because he's submitting to my will. And then the third thing, with him I am well pleased. What's that saying? This is one I'm proud of. I'm proud of him. Pleased by the way he has turned out. Pleased with the way that he is making good God-honoring, wise decisions. Dads, when Jesus was baptized, our Heavenly Father gave us an example, and He showed us three things that our children must sense from us. And look at what they are. They must know that they belong. They must know that they are loved. And they must know that we're proud of them. That's my boy. That's my girl. That's my son. That's my daughter. And that's how a father needs to identify with his children. And dads, do you realize, this is really cool, that you get to carry the same title as God? Father? You're the earthly father. He's the heavenly father. But we strive to, to model, to love our kids the way that God loves us. And you are so loved by your heavenly father that he allows you to be called a father. Why? Because you are made in his image. You are made in his likeness. And he wants you to be in a right relationship with him. And so again, I'll ask the question this morning. Do you need to break the cycle and start some healthy habits in your home? Or if you already have those healthy habits going in your home, just continue. Decide today we're going to continue on this path. Because here's what I want to tell you fathers today. You got this. You got this. You got this. Daddy! You got this.
A hug might be a good. You got this. Come on! You got this! You got this. Dear Jesus. You got this. I want to invite you into my heart. Miss Douglas, they're ready for you. I think he needs it. You got this. So today we want to honor dads. So if you are a dad, a father, would you please stand up for a moment so we can recognize you. Stay standing, please. Someone defied the dad as this. A man who has pictures of his children in his wallet where money used to be. And I think that's a pretty good definition. Pretty true. So we have been blessed by a lot of godly dads in this church, godly fathers, and so this morning uh, we want to pray for you. You have the honor of being an earthly father, and so we just want to pray for you this morning. So if you are sitting next to one of these men and feel comfortable, reach up, grab their hand, and uh, let, let's pray for them. Father, you have blessed us with these men, and I just pray that you will guide them to be great role models and loving to their children. And uh, God, I just pray that they would be fathers like you are a father that they would love the way that you love, that they would lead the way that you lead, that they would listen the way that you listen to us, that they would would forgive the way that you forgive us, that they would extend grace the way that you extend grace to us. Father, we just thank you for being the greatest father of all, but I pray for these men that they will follow your example. Open your word and learn from your word and strive to live your word and follow the example of your son, Jesus Christ. And I just pray for these men and, and the example they're setting for these little ones that they have in their lives or maybe older ones that they have in their lives now, for their grandchildren maybe they have in their lives now. I just pray that they will be good examples and that they will live for you and strive to be your servants here on earth, following you in your footsteps. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.